Uh, we're going to look at uh, John's Gospel, chapter 20, and beginning in verse 19. It says, this is after the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. He said, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The disciples were together. And nearly everything in their lives had changed in the previous 72 hours. A lot of things they hoped for, they didn't think was possible anymore. And the things that they believed, they were now questioning. Jesus had been arrested, he'd been tried, and he'd been executed. And I can't describe how much they loved him and how much they trusted him. And so at this point, they are exhausted and they are confused. Mary had come to them and said that she had seen the resurrected Jesus. But what they had seen was so dark they couldn't unsee it and they couldn't imagine anything other than that. And so they locked the doors. Because that's what you do when you get really afraid. When we are afraid, we tend to lock doors. You can test this in your own life. If you're afraid of rejection, you will tend to lock people out of your life. Um, our fear of not being accepted will help us to create some distance and build some barriers so that we can keep people just a little bit further away. If we're afraid of being ourselves, we will do a lot of pretending, and pretending is the key we use to keep other people locked out while we act like we want them around. It's a really challenging thing. Maybe, maybe we can be afraid of not having enough resources, if we're afraid we won't have enough, then we will lock the door to generosity. We'll rationalize our reluctance to release anything. And we can become suspicious of the needs or at least speculate as to why other people need things or other organizations need things. And maybe if they ran a little better or worked a little harder or tried a little more, then they would be better off than they are. And every rationalization and every suspicion is just another bolt added to the door of generosity. If you're afraid of failure, you will lock the doors to change in your life. You might not be happy with the way things are, but the thought of taking action to move towards a different future can be paralyzing. The truth is, is that most of us will choose an uncomfortable present over an uncertain future. We do it all the time. It's a really dangerous thing. You can almost hear the bolts just sliding in the locks locking. Everything that can happen to a person can also happen to a community, to an organization, to an institution. What happens is we begin to remember the things that were good in the past, and those memories feel very positive, and they seem to be brighter than the future that we try to paint for ourselves. And when we remember something from the past, that positive emotion feels good, but when we think about the future, we can become a little uncomfortable. And that feels a lot like fear. And in those environments, faith gets redefined as something that we cling to rather than something that motivates us. That's not how faith is supposed to be. So we just lock the door. We don't want to lose something good. And we don't want something bad to happen. And by the way, fear has a lot of faces. It doesn't always look like, like panic or terror. We've all had those moments in our lives but it doesn't always look the same. Fear, fear can have a lesser intensity. If you've ever had a really high fever, once it gets to a certain point, you, you just can't function anymore. You just want to crawl in the bed and cover up and not move. But, but we've all functioned with low-grade fevers where we just are not comfortable, but we keep going. And fear can come to us like that. Sometimes it just feels like insert uncertainty. We're not really sure how something's going to work out. We're not able to decide what it is we need to choose. And even when the potential cost is not that significant, we're just afraid of making a wrong choice. Or it can look like frustration. 
This is surprising because a lot of times we think frustration is, makes us feel strong, but not really. A lot of our frustration flows out of anxiety. We may feel a little bit stronger while we're venting, but what's happening is that something we value or care about or someone we value or care about feels at risk, and so our response is to become frustrated. Uh, our culture is filled with this. I'm convinced. Listen to the loudest and angriest voices. They're saturated in fear. We are told this is an age of rage. I don't think it is. I think it is an age of fear. And we don't know how else to express it. So, faith can have many faces. But faith does not eliminate fear. It confronts fear. This is the surprise to us. We want our faith to eliminate our fear. That's not how it actually works. Faith ne or Fear never goes away by avoiding something. Right? You actually have to face it in some way. Anxiety doesn't seem to be as high when we avoid things, but it actually never goes away. We, we feel a little bit better when we don't see it, but here's the thing that you need to know about the things you fear. They follow you. They follow you. In fact, if you want to keep the same distance from them, you better learn how to run. And that's what people do in life. Fear can only be overcome by facing the things that we are afraid of. And here's the surprise. We assume that when faith comes into our life, it will cause us to feel fearless. When I get faith, I won't be afraid anymore. I will feel invulnerable. I will feel supremely confident. But I... I want you to know, that's not how faith works. That's not what happens. Faith doesn't make you fearless. Faith makes you brave. And there's a difference. You cannot really be brave unless you are afraid. It doesn't take bravery for me to eat a really good meal. It takes bravery for me to eat some of the things I've been served in some of the places that I've been. And I have learned, don't even ask. It's better that you don't know. <laughs> Bravery is the ability to act in spite of fear, not in the absence of fear. This is how faith works. I have to tell you, there have been times in my life when I didn't want to act and I didn't want to speak. I wasn't sure how something was going to turn out, and I didn't know how I was going to be perceived. And I watched my body betray my anxiety. I watched my hands sweat, and my posture slump, and my hands tremble, and I heard my voice quiver while I tried to get my words out, and I hate that. I don't like looking intimidated. But the power of faith is not in the steadiness of our hands or the confidence in our voice. The power of faith is in our willingness to speak or our willingness to act. The power of faith makes a difference. Our lives and our world will never be changed uh, for the better by the locks that we latch. Our lives and our world will be changed for the better by the doors that we open. And opening doors requires that we speak up, we stand up, we step out. That's what's required. In fact, it tells us this in James chapter 2, as the body without the spirit is dead, faith without deeds, without action, it's dead. So here's, here's the struggle that we need to remember. Uh, we, we all experience fear. No one's exempt from that. But we also have an opportunity to act in faith. And we can misinterpret that feeling. When that feeling of fear comes in, we might misinterpret it as though maybe this is, maybe this is God's warning me. This is, I shouldn't take any action. I, I need to step back. I need to sit down. I need to be quiet. Courage precedes confidence. If you're waiting to feel confident before you act, that's not how it works. We have to do something. And then when we see the difference it makes, that's when the celebration and the confidence comes. So how do you move from fear to faith? First of all, remember that you are not alone. God is actually with you. 
The most frequent encouragement that God gives when he shows up in people's lives in Scripture is that he tells them, you don't need to be afraid. Don't be afraid. And the reason he says this is because we are afraid. Often. All of us. But this is the thing I love. Our fears do not keep him from showing up. Your fear is not greater than God. Your fear will not drive him away. He's not embarrassed by it, and he doesn't try to avoid it. He shows up anyway. Secondly, faith will often feel right rather than easy. Faith feels like the right thing to do rather than the easy thing to do. It takes courage to tell the truth. It takes courage to apply for the school that you want. It takes courage to sign up for a class that, that you are concerned might be academically more demanding than you're capable of. It takes courage to put in for a promotion. It takes courage to take less money when you want to make a real difference. It takes courage to show back up in a room you were not taken seriously in. It's far easier to lie or at least keep quiet. It's far easier to procrastinate than to act. It's far easier to make someone else responsible for your future than yourself. It's far easier to take the option that makes more money. Easy doesn't require faith. Faith isn't for the easy things. It's for the difficult things. It's for the challenging things. It's for the painful things. It's for the scary things. Faith will paralyze you, but faith will animate you. And this is what I love about Steps of Faith. You don't have to leap. Just even a word, a phrase, a step in the right direction, even the smallest gesture and the quietest word brings a smile from heaven because heaven knows doors are being unlocked and opened and faith is making a difference in our world. Secondly is that faith finds purpose. Faith finds purpose. Even the most difficult things can be managed and endured when we realize we have a purpose and a meaning behind it. If the student understands that it's not just about trying to get a good grade on a test, but the purpose is to prepare for an opportunity that may come to them, that helps them get through the academic uh, regimen of, of study. The, the person who keeps trying to have a difficult conversation with someone that they have a relationship with, not just to win an argument, but because they want their hearts to actually be drawn together. If that's the purpose, it's amazing how many times you'll keep trying. The person who consistently releases hard-earned resources isn't trying to earn credit from someone or pay down a moral debt. They just want to see what God can do with what they're willing to take the locks off of. If you've been around here very long, you know our church family has a mission statement, and that is to create a safe place for people to find faith, friends, and the future. And it would be easy to say, well, if you're looking for a safe place, isn't that to avoid any anxiety or any fear? And that's not how we think about it. That would be a misunderstanding of our mission and our goal. Our goal is not to create a place where we're never challenged and we never try and we never risk. Our goal is to create a place where we feel safe enough to try and to be challenged and to risk. We are living that out corporately. Even as we expand our facility, there's a lot of reasons not to try to do something like this. I can think of a lot of them. But that's not why we're here. We're here for a purpose that's greater than that. So Jesus concludes this conversation with the disciples who were locking the doors. And this is what he says. As the Father has sent me, I'm going to send you. He shows them his wounds and his scars. He, he doesn't ever try to fool us in anything. Sent people get wounded. Sent people have scars. But every one of them will say it was worth it because the purpose was greater than all of it. That's the difference that it makes. So he tells them, unlock the doors. I'm sending you out. And he breathes on them. And he tells them, receive the Holy Spirit because God wants to release his power in us so that he can release us into the world. That's how it works. Now, I've 
I've come to realize that there's actually no empty lives. I used to think there were. It's not true. Everyone's life is filled with something. Some of our lives are filled with fear or regret or anger or selfishness or greed or a bunch of other things. But Jesus calls us to be filled with something else instead. Be filled with the Spirit. This is what it says in Ephesians 5. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Or in 2 Timothy 1, the Spirit of God has not, does not make us timid. He doesn't lead us to be paralyzed by fear and to lock our doors. He gives us power. He gives us love. He gives us a sound mind. I think God is calling each and every one of us to participate in his plan for our lives, for our world, for our community, and for our church family. And it happens when we move from fear towards faith. Let's bow our heads this morning. I think some of us are just better at hiding our anxiety than others. We've learned how to walk into a room, how to position ourselves, or avoid being seen when we can't manage the appearance as well as we like. But please don't misunderstand There's not a one of us that doesn't know fear. There's not a one of us that doesn't lock things up and lock things in and lock things out. And it destroys our life while we feel safer. What if Jesus were walking into this room today and what if he were saying, Take the bolts off the doors. Unlock all the latches. Throw them wide open. Stop hiding. Start taking steps that matter. Not because you feel confident. So, so I walk into rooms regularly I would prefer to avoid. I don't feel competent for them. I don't know that I have something to say. But what I've discovered is I pray a pretty candid prayer in those situations. I tell God, you know, there's a lot of people who could do a better job at this than me. But this is what I tell them. But I'm the one who showed up. I'm the option you have to exercise right now. So if you can give me any wisdom, any insight with trembling hands and with a quivering voice, I'll do the best that I can. And I have discovered that God will do the most amazing things. The most amazing things. So Father, help us find the courage to take the locks off the doors and to boldly go. Not because we don't sense anxiety, not because we have confidence in ourselves, but we trust the winds of heaven have a better purpose for our lives than to hide. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning?